Welcome everyone here on the Backstage Pass. It is Monday. We are kicking off the week with Turk McNamara and myself, host here, Kirstie Kraus, and also accompanied with Jeff McMahon. We're so happy to be here today. Thank you to Hank Productions and uh, Bangtel Whiskey and of course Mitch Max, our sponsors. We will get to those Kraus, more in a little bit. We got a little bit of a playback happening. Feel free to share this stream as you guys come in and also ask questions with us we got a lot to cover today and without further ado let's get into it how's it going Turk how are you thank you for coming on the backstage pass today hey Kirsty, I'm wonderful thank you so very much for having me on I'm delighted to be here absolutely after reading about you today and learning more and listening to your music I cannot wait to physically get over to your location we are celebrating two singles that recently came out and also the opening of Turk's Lounge. So uh, there's lots to talk about today and uh, just Turk's Lounge is right on top of McNamara's Irish Pub and Restaurant over there on, uh, can you describe us the part of town? Yeah, we're in Donaldson. So McNamara's opened in 2010 and um, we've been open, it'll be 12 years this coming February. So we're about two miles away from the airport. Uh, but we have been uh, a live music venue in the downstairs area of the restaurant since we opened. But when we shut down for COVID, uh, my wife and I kind of had some discussion and we decided we'd put in a second stage in the upstairs venue, which is uh, now called Turk's Lounge. And it's really a, a throwback to all the small rooms that I would have played when I first moved here that I think Nashville, unfortunately, is kind of losing through you know, the great unyielding concrete, you know what I mean? It just kind of keeps building in town and all those smaller town like rooms are starting to slip away. So we put that together as a opportunity to kind of keep that alive here in town. Absolutely. And it sounds like there's no better person to know about these type of rooms coming to Nashville in 1995 and getting to play some of the best rooms here in Nashville, Douglas corner, which we are very sorry like uh, we said, to say goodbye to. Yeah. You. Douglas Warner was a great room. It was an important room to me. Mervyn was great to me, um, very kind to me, and and it was a it was a special place for a lot of people. And and there was a few other places like that in town for me. Windows on the Cumberland was like that for me on Second Avenue, which was a classic old Nash Nashville venue that is kind of gone by the wayside. And then the old Sutler and and some of the other places that were here in town, you know, that were really you could get in touch with the song on an intimate level that you don't often find as relevant or you know accessible these days as you could back then yeah and also including the bluebird i mean talk to us about being able to perform at the bluebird and what that was like now that we have the show nashville out and everybody knows about the bluebird yeah describe us what that was like the bluebird for me is obviously the pinnacle of being able to perform as a songwriter in town mm -hmm. and so when I had that opportunity, it was it was a great experience. We brought in a great crowd. I had some great writers that played with me at some of those shows, Dylan Altman, a few others. But, you know, it was – when you play the Bluebird, you better bring your A game because everybody else is, if that makes any sense. But it was a great experience for me, and I'm looking forward to playing it again. It's been a while. I, I kind of took a step back from the music industry when we opened up the restaurant, and then when we shut down for the six months, I kind of decided to run back at it again. So I'm hoping to get that chance to play the Bluebird again here soon. Awesome. Well, Turk, you know, you talk about the songwriter venues, and um, I've played them, Kirsty, you know, certainly has played them. Um, but, but dig a little further into what you're talking about when you say a songwriter venue, because I know uh, of you and your music, uh, and you take that songwriter piece of the music, uh, very seriously, you know, not only in the, in what you're hoping to develop at your place, but, um, but in how you create your music and what you do, both your your more contemporary stuff as well as some of the traditional stuff that you do. So talk about what is so important about that songwriter piece and what you think we're trying to preserve. I believe what I'm trying to preserve is the ability for an audience and a songwriter to engage and relate in a way that becomes more it's a personal connection that is hard to find when you're removed from the stage when you come into turk's lounge 
they're all two tops up front. There's there's bench seating. There's there's opportunity to be very, very close to the sound, and the sound is impeccable. That's the other thing that's really important to me. I mean, the best rooms sound the best. And so we've taken as much time as we can in the last year to really dial in the sound. And so when you add the opportunity of people sitting in a room close to an artist and close to a songwriter and singing those songs in their most ripped down story, like basic forms and how they were in conceived and the passion that goes into writing those songs. And you can feel it because you're sitting right next to that person and you can sound that, that you can hear it because it's all around you. That's what makes for me an important part of the legacy of the songwriter in Nashville. I, I grew up listening to singer songwriters in the seventies. And then when I moved to Nashville, I started listening to some of the country singer songwriters of the same era, Christopherson and, and Mac Davis and Jesse Winchester and Mickey Newberry and those guys. And so there was a time in Nashville when people could go down Tans Van Zandt. I mean, come on, you go down and you catch some of the greatest song, Harlan Howard, the greatest musicians, the greatest songwriters ever playing in rooms that you could go up and talk to them afterwards. And there are still a few of those rooms in town, but it's not, I wanted it to be a place where people could really let their guard down and enjoy each other's company and not have to worry about anything other than just the music and the words and the songs. Absolutely. Right. And like you said, we have a brand new room to be celebrating and going to. So we want to talk. When when did you know? It sounds like for a while you knew that you wanted to open a space like as special as Turk's Lounge. <sighs> talk to us about that process because you started you have the restaurant since 2010. So, yeah, was that kind of hmm, this space is going to work? No, absolutely. We have this. Okay. No, it's funny because both con concepts have come out of a conversation between my wife paul and myself and, th and the first concept was i was playing like 300 gigs a year playing irish music here in town and i was frustrated because i was playing venues that didn't care about the music as much as i did and paula said it's too bad we couldn't open our own place and that was kind of what was the the catalyst that got the ball rolling for opening mcnamara's and then things ran hard for 12 years and i, I learned a lot about running a venue and learning the sound and i had learned a lot anyway because i spent a lot of time on stage but then when we shut down i was kind of talking about the upstairs and at that time the upstairs was a sports lounge and we had darts and we had tvs and coming out of covid you weren't allowed to use darts you weren't allowed to use pool cues you weren't allowed to use checker pieces or anything like that anything that was tactile and so and, and darts are fun but they don't they don't make me money. And, and, and it just didn't, it wasn't where we wanted to go coming out of COVID. And Paula said, it's too bad. We couldn't open up a second stage upstairs. And that everything was, everything starts with too bad. I love everything <laughs> starts with that. Yes, ma'am. And, and I'll tell you what, thank God for it because it was, I went upstairs on a Wednesday with a hammer and started taking down some of the walls. And the next thing you know, we're building the stage and then we're adding pieces and we're building it piece by piece. And it's taken a year and I've taken my time. I mean, we were only launching it now officially because I wanted to make sure that the room was in peace. I wanted to make sure the room was what I wanted it to be because, and, and with everything you can't, you can predict it to a point, but it isn't until you get on that stage and you play it, you listen to the speakers that you listen to the sound and you listen to the monitors and you're trying to hear the mix and you're trying to understand what the sound of the people is coming at you. And once you put all those things together and the lighting and you feel like it's in its place, that's when it's ready. And it's taken a while, but it's ready and it's there. And I can't wait to kind of just have it as an opportunity as a vehicle for songwriters and musicians and people to use it to spread their music and have the opportunity to spread mine there as well all right you guys you heard it here make sure you get down to turk's lounge and check it out check out the sound talk to turk himself please come on say hi <laughs> i'm there yes, yes he is he is there all the time I, I have no doubt yeah um okay now now turk just just to be clear um because what you just said might have been a little confusing to somebody that thinks Oh, he finally put um, a musical stage into his place. Yeah, no, you just I put a, said I put a my second, second. The yeah. second, right? So, so you know, what about the first? What what is that? So the first stage is we built downstairs. I fell into playing 
professionally in town in 1996 at a pub called Mulligan's on Second Avenue, which was a great opportunity for a young kid to get on stage. And what mm-hmm. turned into an opportunity to be on stage turned into um, I became the house band. And it was a gig. It was a 10 year steady house band gig on Second Avenue that kind of cut my teeth on the craft of how to perform and entertain. And then next thing you know, Opperland Hotel opened up a pub called Finley's and I got hired to be the house band there. And then Dan McGinnis opened and I got hired to play there. And so it got to a point where I was playing all those different nights. And then when we opened up the pub, what I tried to do is I took all the best pieces from all those different venues that I liked and all the things that I thought to myself I could approve upon. And I put it together in this room that was downstairs and it's a long rectangular room with a low ceiling great sound i've been playing with my bandmates with these guys doing the irish music josh cully and i have been playing together for 21 years and dave has been playing in the band for 17 and so when you get three guys who play together that long we're we're best friends and we 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 just we stay i don't know we, we there's not much space but we're hardly playing i can't really explain it any other way than that i mean we understand each other so well and we we it's a, it's a beautiful thing for me as a musician and an entertainer to have a steady gig in a venue that I don't have to worry about other than anything showing up and plugging in and playing. And that was kind of the idea. And it's been wonderful. I mean, it's been wonderful. We have a tremendous following. We have great food at the restaurant. We have a great staff. Our staff are unbelievable. They all came back to work for us when we reopened last year. We've got a clientele that have really taken ownership of us as well and so they've embraced the irish and the irish tradition is very important to country tradition because in my opinion i think country music and the old appellations and all that stuff that kind of came from that east tennessee kentucky style of country music came straight from the irish and the scotch irish and so you take you know 25 years of playing that and you take 27 years of writing songs from the the 70s catalog and and then you mix in some contemporary modern country with it and the next thing you know turk's deciding he's going to write songs again and, and use this downstairs stage once again for the Irish, but also as an opportunity to get people through the door and use the upstairs stage as an opportunity to exploit the songs, but also give other, other people a chance to perform here in town. Yes. You also it's big. have quite a bit of range <laughs> in your voice too. You get yeah. down to some bass notes, but then you're like pushing some tenor notes as well, which it, really was awesome to hear. It's not as low. Or my voice was a lot higher when I moved to town. <laughs> I'll tell you this: what I used to sing in like E, I'm singing, you know, down in A. I mean, it's crazy how much it's dropped. But I just think that's just with age and experience and alcohol and and you know what I mean. That all the all the stuff that kind of goes with performing and and having the opportunity to to sing as often and as much as I've had it, it, it just kind of develops and takes into a, a, a tone of its own, which is I'm pretty blessed with. Yeah. Lots of late restaurant hours. Yeah, you know, and not as late as it used to be. I mean, my first gig used to play yeah. at one twenty in the morning, and I used to get home like sure. three, and it felt like forever. Oh I'm done now at like quarter uh-huh. to ten, and I'm like, I get home by like eleven thirty. I'm like, oh my god, I'd be just starting my second set if I were still playing. Donald well, Trump. now, yeah, that may be true unless it's St. Patrick's Day, right? Yeah, that's a long day. That's actually yeah, what all day. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. Last year we came up with a concept that really, really worked. I've played a lot of years in town. I've played this would be my twenty eighth St. Patrick's Day playing in town. My longest gig. A long story short is usually you're hopping from gig to gig to gig to gig, and 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 that's a great opportunity for an Irish musician. You make hay when you can, you know. But what we did last year coming out of COVID, and and, and we. Coming out of COVID, we had to address a lot of different things with regards to how we operated to be able to be compliant with all the, you know, things that have been, you know, put together and also making sure everybody's safe and such. And so what we did was we put a two hour rotational limit on the room and it's it's. It worked out that I start playing at 10 o'clock in the morning and I'll play from 10 to 10.50. And then I take a 10 minute break and then I play from 11 to 11.50 and then I take a 10 minute break. And every couple hours we cycle the room by people, which has allowed us to get people through the door. But by the time it's done, we're talking 13 solid hours. But it's fun. I mean, St. Patrick's Day is one of the easiest days of the year because you get so much energy back. You know what I mean? And you're up there and everybody's ready to have a good time. And not only that, if you're rotating the room, by the time people come in for that time, you're coming to that third set or fourth set or eighth set or ninth set they're still rare to go and nothing's yeah. going to invigorate you faster than having the people ready to go with you and they're all dressed up and it's fun i think i know where oh, it's to fun. go for st patrick's come on it's i i guarantee you you'll it, it is an enjoyable fun time it is it, it's been a, it's been a great a great opportunity for us so kirsty i mean you're you're a performer when was the last time you did a 13-hour game never 
Oh no, never. Oh, I don't even know. I'd have to have <laughs> lots of coffee and red wine. But like you said, the people. So I don't. I don't know what it's ridiculously like. easier than it sounds. It, it is like, I, I mean, because you blink and the next thing you know, you're like six sets in. Right. And you're like, yeah. all right. So I started at 10, it's four o'clock. We're playing to 11. I've only got seven hours to go. How hard can it be? And the next thing you know, it's like yeah. eight o'clock and then the sun's going and then they're rocking. And now, now you're playing the proclaimers and you're doing all the whiskey, the jar stuff and everybody's yeah. going to, to town. And it's all about trying to navigate the show so that everybody takes the ride with you. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's fun. I'm not lying. It's fun. I'm looking forward to it. I always look forward to it. I mean, that's the same. Like, I feel like when I talk about driving 16 hours, some people are like, what? But you do get used to it. I mean, you, yeah. you get used to it and you have, yeah, like your pockets. and You'll, you'll find zone, uh, zones of like, mm -hmm. you know, wander <laughs> for whatever yeah. it is. You know, you yeah. kind of, especially when you're driving and, you, and you're, you're, you know, 14 hours in and you're, you're thinking about what the hell you're going to do when you're 70. It's great, you know? <laughs> yeah, we so we have music as well to celebrate that kind of ramped up and helped to celebrate Turk's Lounge and the, and the opening of it. And one of them being Cold November Rain that came out in November of 2021. It did. Uh, why don't we have you perform that song and then we can talk all about it afterwards? Sure, I'd be glad to. Thank you so much. Here this is the latest single out right now. We're having... Turk McNamara perform his latest single. There you go. Well, autumn leaves are barely on the tree. When I whisper, wind blank is the ground. In the rustle beneath my footsteps. Oh, is the only sound Well, I smile at the sky up above me When I feel her wet caress The pain of her cold numbs my soul it washes the ache from my chest And I'm traveling now And I'm traveling now And I have broken the last chain And I'm finally healed Oh, I'm healed By the cold Well, all my mistakes are clear to me. I've come to realize my fate. The rain has made me see that is never too late. To keep traveling now, to keep traveling now. And I have broken the last chain. And I'm finally healed, oh, I'm healed by the cold November rain. And I'm traveling now. I'm traveling now, and I have broken the last chain, and I'm finally healed, oh, I'm healed, by the cold November rain, by the cold November rain. Bear the cold November rain. Go behind the scenes with some of the biggest artists in music today with the Backstage Pass, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. Join Brandon Morrell and his co-host, Hersey Krause, 
and Jeff McMahon as they talk to rising stars and legends about their music career. Listen to their latest tracks and learn fun facts about the men and women behind the music you love. And be sure to tune in to the Backstage Pass Monday through Friday from 3.30 to 6.30, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. And welcome in to the Backstage Pass. The tail pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash base. The front has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle. And the tail has a super smooth and warm finish. Wow. Turk McNamara, cold November rain. Thank you very much. Oh, man. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, once again, folks are just now kind of jumping in. We are the Backstage Pass. Brought to you by our friends with Bangtail Whiskey and Hank Jr. Productions. And of course, Mitch Max, if you want to get some swag and wave your backstage pass flag, that's how you would do it. <laughs> All right. um, uh, I'm so glad to, to hear uh, that you're finally putting some of your own music out. Um, you know, it's, I know that uh, when you first started putting out your music, I, I was not sure what to expect. The first time I knew of you musically, I saw you on TV because um, you were on uh, Jimmy Bowen and Friends, right? Yeah, season two. It was a great opportunity. Yeah, Jimmy asked us to be on. It was awesome. That was the first time I think we, that's how we met our introduction through that is right. Yeah, yeah. And now that was that was not Turk McNamara. That was Nosy Flynn. It was, which is the band name we've used for the Irish forever. You know? Okay. And, and, uh, okay. It, it nosy Flynn is a character from Ulysses by James Joyce. And so when the main character walks into the pub, the first person he sees sitting at the bar stool is nosy Flynn. Mm -hmm. And so we thought that was kind of a cool idea for bands. When you walk in the first people you see us playing, so we called ourselves nosy Flynn. That would have been 20 ooh, a long time ago. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, but then I, you know, we shut down, like I said, and, I moved here to write songs. I moved here to be a singer and I moved here to be a performer and entertainer. And I have performed and entertained it or entertained it, entertained the entire time I've been here. But, you know, and I've written songs pretty consistently since we opened the restaurant, but I was, I was running hard at it in 2007. And then some of the folks I was working with, some things took a turn as is known to happen in the music business. And I took a step back. And when I took the step back, we opened up the pub. And, you know, the next thing I know, it's 12 years and, and I've got plenty of contacts and a lot of experience and such. But then we shut down and then I had a tremendous amount of free time on my hands. And when I had that free time on my hands, things woke up inside of me that I hadn't felt in a while as far as the songwriter and the person who moved here for all that. And I went, you know what? I'm going to run at this thing. I'm going to run at this thing as hard as I can and as fast as I can because I finally feel like I'm ready. And I think the real difference between now and when i used to run through it before is that i've got 12 years of running a restaurant underneath my belt and and the experiences of dealing with people but also becoming better as a musician and ideally better as a songwriter and i did i started i started flirting with the idea of putting my songs back out there and i said a prayer to god and i said please put in my path whoever it is that needs to be in my path and jimmy bowen walked into the pub one night when i was playing and jimmy and i knew each other from mulligans back in the day and he asked me to be on the show and the next thing you know i meet sherry cranford and she is a rock star for me and introducing to me some people and through sherry i met you jeff and and i've met some other wonderful people here in town that are really working hard to work with me and, and help me troy castellano and a few others and and it's it's been a great opportunity for me, but it's also empowering when you're playing songs for people and they're responding in a positive way. And it gives you the encouragement you need to kind of keep going because Lord knows we all need as much encouragement yeah. in this game as possible, you know? 
So with cold November rain, you kind of maybe answered my question a little bit. Like when you, that was a solo write for you. It was. When yep. was it written? You know, talk to us about the the meaning, what what you were feeling, where, where did it come from, kind of the process of writing it. Cold November rain is one of my older songs, and and when I say older songs, it means that I wrote it twenty something years ago, and then I rewrote it you know, a month or so ago, you know, that kind of thing. They're always kind of tweaking. This one really kind of fell into place early on in, in the development of it. But I wrote cold November rain. I, I was working at the cooker on West end, which was, Oh uh, yeah, 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 man. It was the busiest restaurant in the state of Tennessee. When I worked there it was 1997, it was right across the street from Vanderbilt, which is now Jay Alexander's. And so I was working a double and I had a van that I used to drive to and from work from, from Antioch. And so I went outside to my van on a break and I had my guitar and I started putting words to, to the guitar and cold over rain fell out. It fell out of nowhere. I, it's, it's one of those songs and it sat with me and it stayed with me and I've sung it for years and years and years. And the words have never really changed, but the intonation and the melody have evolved to the point that it's become a lot more personal for me. It, it, it's, I, I just think it's matured musically because it's kind of, it's like wine, you know what I mean? Some of these songs get better the longer they sit with you because ideally we get better as performers and songwriters. And, and so they can't help but improve, especially if you stay true to what the original instinct was when you wrote them, if that makes sense. Uh, well sure. Said. Yeah. You definitely can tell that you are putting a lot of feeling in, in oh, I write from the soul, Kirsty. I do. I, I, it's, it's songwriting is a very, very, very deep thing for me. And, and at the same time, I love writing with people, and I love the opportunity to have that chance to, you know, kind of take it to, to the other level. Because inevitably, I go to one chord and they go to the other, and their chord's better. And man, how cool is that? You know. And, and so that's the other thing that I'm enjoying at this stage of the game is I'm starting to write with other folks again. And I've I've co-written here nor there, but I'm. I'm reaching out to some people that I've known through the years and, and setting up some of the rights with them. And then, you know, just, just like I said, I'm running at it. I'm, I'm having a go and we're going to see where it can take us. I'm excited. Absolutely. And then just the, a little over a month before that, in October of 2021, you released What Happens in Between. So why don't we talk about that song a little bit? And then I hear that we have an awesome video to go along yeah. with that. The irony, uh, and, and as I sit here, it kind of dawns on me. What happens in between is, is it was referenced from a homily, and 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 the story goes, you know, and we've all heard in some form or fashion, you know, you fill a, a, a pitcher with rocks, and it's you know those are the big things in life, and then you fill it with pebbles, and you can fill it with sand, and and all those other things. The way I like to look at it, when I talk to my children, I go, I tell them, you know, in life, I think we have like 14 or 15 amazing days, like the best day of our life, the day you meet the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with, the day your child is born, you know, the, the day you win the state championship, some of these things that are just really monumental. And then you're going to have like seven or eight really, really hard days. You know what I mean? You're going to lose your grandmother unexpectedly or, or, or some, your dog gets knocked down, things that really hurt and you don't see them coming and they hurt. But life's everything else that happens in between those times, you know what I mean? And so... The key is to make sure everything that happens in between those you make the most of because it's what happens in between. Although those moments define us, it's what happens in between that makes us who we are. At least that's kind of how I, I approached the song when I wrote it. Awesome. What a beautiful message. And then did you write this with anything? Anybody I, I did. Um, yep, absolutely. I, uh, I'm drawing a blank. God bless. <laughs> okay. well, we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back to it. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank right. you. Well, we can uh, let's watch the video. Yep, um, of that song, um, and uh, uh, you know, you can kind of go through that. And I, I definitely want to uh, also talk about the making of the video. Please, um, absolutely. What, yeah. what you did with that when we get back, but um, so uh, give that some thought. We'll go ahead and watch the video, and then you can uh, uh, lay the story on us after we get back. You got it. Thanks. What happens in between? Two loves bear the ocean So young to understand How the tire that runs beneath their feet Will wash away the sand Time keeps drifting these years is all and no one sees the future in a cloud of crystal ball Help is hard to figure out even when the bits are in tomorrow's still beyond our reach we can 
can't change where we've been. We cried as overrated. They got a plan to seem very sane. And when the credits roll, I understand it's what happens in between. Some are born of laughter, some are bust of tears. The only thing that's certain is when the gypsy calls. Even she can't see the future in a cloud of crystal ball. Life is hard to figure out, even when the bets are in. Tomorrow's still beyond our reach, we can't change where we've been. We cried as overrated. We got a plan to sing bad sing. And when the credits roll, understand it's what happens in between. What happens in between? Okay, Turk. So tell us, tell us what we just saw. You saw me performing a song I wrote with Tony Kerr, <laughs> by the way, nice. um, playing in the upstairs lounge at Turk's Lounge with my friend Steve Peavy, who's a bandmate of mine. He's a member. He plays with the Grand Ole Opry House Band uh, uh, pretty regularly these days and um, multi-instrumentalist. And so what you saw in that video was kind of a flavor and a taste of what I hope Turk's Lounge to is it, what it conveys it was recorded in turks lounge it was recorded by randy schaefer and he was the director who is like ridiculously talented and i'm blessed yeah. that he's taken the chance yeah, to you know work with me and and you know josh waters did sound and josh waters is you know he does sound for chris jansen and he plays bass for chris jansen and these are people that are like really really successful in the game that are taking the opportunity to help me and and so my goal is to try and help everybody else and, and be as successful with it as possible yeah, it's um, uh, I've I've been, Kirsty. If you haven't been there yet, you've got to go check the the lounge out. It's it's uh, it's it's everything that you describe as to the way it feels up there, you know, from the lighting and the wood and 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 the the way he moves the light fixtures around to accommodate <laughs> the songwriters. We, well, we do a uh, true in the round. Yeah. We're <clears> actually the only room in town. That I, well, I mean, they might still do it periodically, but we are going to do at least one true in the round every month in the, and, and when I mean in the round, I mean, literally the light comes down from the ceiling. Everybody's facing themselves. There's that intimacy that used to be the Douglas corner in the round that we don't get anymore. Jeff's actually going to be playing it. I, I'm excited. We've got That's some folks awesome. playing on the 27th. And, and so that is another thing, another facet of the room that I think makes it unique and also, you know, faithful to that, that room that I described with the beginning is, is, you know in the round is one of the coolest way to see a show especially when it's songwriter driven obviously as they all are but when they have that ability to kind of talk with each other and then each other's kind of circle of of creativity i find that a lot of times some of the 
the worries and the barriers come down and you hear songs in a way that not are often you don't hear them that way on stage like you do in the round at least in my opinion in my experience well i think uh i mean i know from when i've done things like that and uh kirsty i know you've you've probably done some of these though we've never gotten to do them together um when you want the songwriters to be able to collaborate and bring something different to the performance, the fact that they are in a position to see each other and communicate with each other uh, makes it easier for them to do that uh, for the surrounding audience. So uh, I love doing things in the round like that. Cool. Yeah. Like, like almost like you're, you're just hanging out, like you're in the living room. Like, that's exactly right. And that's that's the vibe, Kirsty. You know what I mean? That's what we're heading for. What we're heading for is the opportunity for people to kind of let their guard down and listen to music in the most primal way that we can present it in Nashville. It, it, you know, if you if you do the sound right, it doesn't sound like it's amplified. You know, it just sounds like you're hearing the guys as they're singing and as they're playing. And 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 to be honest with you, obviously, room structure and the setup of the room has a lot to do with that. But we've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that it sounds unbelievable. And it's been a really it's been a wonderful reception that we're getting from the people that are starting to discover it because they come in and, and we have certain bands that play on a regular basis as well as the songwriters. And, and that's kind of cool for us because it kind of gives us some continuity of content. Uh, the country cousins play up there on Fridays and Saturdays, Tim Bolin and Luke Mundy. And they play with Aaron Till, who's an amazing player in town. And they do old time country, like, con like, like really, you know, I, I often call them soldiers for country music because, you know, there's this group of folks in Nashville, Tennessee who play all the time. The, the, the scene they play down on lower broad and they'll play out there at the local and they're playing for us at Turks lounge, but they're playing it because they love it and they love the music and, and their passion isn't, obviously their passion is to try and be successful in the music, but it's bigger than that for them. For them, it's keeping a tradition alive that is, is true to how they see it and how they feel it. And Turks lounge is kind of becoming a room where people are feeling that they're having that opportunity to kind of, once they play it, they go, wow, that's kind of cool because they haven't really felt something like that in a while. And, and that's, that's fun. And that's when, for me, when I'm in the audience and I see somebody, when all of a sudden it kind of dawns on them and they go, Oh wow! And they can hear themselves, and then a funny thing happens when you start to hear yourself, man. You you start to sing better, you start to play better, you start to inter interact better because nothing will help a show or hurt a show worse than bad sound. I mean, in my opinion, of what I've done, and so we've really we've really worked for that. But it's also it's it's got to be it's got to be people up there who really care, and that's what we have. And I mean, because that's what it's all about for me. I, I care. Uh, everything that I do when it comes to music or the restaurant or my family, I care with everything I got and you got to give everything you have every time. Otherwise you're not worth doing it, you know? And so I find that we're, I've got kindred spirits in town of people who are feeling that same way. And they kind of are hoping to spread the word for me. And, and you know, if, if we take it from here and we can kind of make it something that people are really aware of and it becomes a bit of a destination, then it's an opportunity, like I said, for people who are maybe just cutting their teeth or people who want to break in new songs or or or, or whatever other opportunity that I even have thought of comes to, to mind. It's still something that hopefully can be there to help all of us kind of achieve whatever we moved here to do. I love that. You are continuing to pass the torch forward and be the protector of the passion and the space for songwriters. And oh, you got to pay it forward. I mean, there's some people in this town who are really, really important to keeping that stuff going. JT Gray down there at the station in as far as what he did and keeping the bluegrass alive and Mervin over there at Douglas Corner. And there are people that, you know, even, uh, you know, you look at all the folks that have given everything they've got to keep this town, you know, relevant. And there's a lot of folks that I think we need to make sure we stay truthful and, and honor not just the musicians but some of the people that led the way that had the clubs that kind of let the the music grow and become what we know today well talk about talk about this for a second and then um uh, we're going to bounce back to our sponsors for helping us kind of put this forward before we circle back and kind of wrap things up but um you know you talk about you know, paying it forward and trying to take care of those people that came before you. I mean, here you are uh, just now kind of starting to put some of your own music out there, but you, you have already gotten support from 
you know, people like Jimmy who has a, a platform, Jimmy Bowen, who has a platform to kind of help support things. And, um, you know, Randy Schaefer making this video who, you know, I know Randy from shooting things with, um, you know, friends of mine. He, he tours with Chris Lane a lot. I know he does that. Um, you know, Josh working with Chris Jansen, Chris has played the Opry over a hundred times. Yeah. You know, you've, you've got clearly some people in your corner that, that has to be kind of encouraging that you're doing the right thing. Right. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. And I'll tell you that the, the other thing that kind of happened was I went into the studio for the first time in 12 years. And I, and, and when I went in, I went in with nothing other than what I wanted it to sound like coming back out. And that's a, that's mm -hmm. a pretty liberating way to be when you go in. And so what I came out with, I felt was really representative of who I am musically in my songs. And they are, when I'm playing them for some people, they're, they're striking a chord because they're not sounding like a lot of other songs that people are hearing right now. And that's not a bad thing. And, and, and so what I find is happening is that people are kind of responding to them and, and, the likes of you know the folks you mentioned jeff and and i mean even robin ruddy and johnny garcia and some of these other people that are kind of taking the time to listen and they're going yeah yeah you know what i mean jc Bado at big yellow dog and, and I'm, I'm 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 speaking to people and i'm finally putting it out there and i'm because that's the hardest part right the hardest well, part and is, you go, here you go and then you put it out there and but it's it's coming back to me and, and it's it's a wonderful feeling. It's it's really I mean, all these years that I kind of was like, oh, I used to be afraid of the music business, man. I'm not afraid of the music business anymore. I'm like ready to go. Come on. Here we go. I, I mean, I just navigated a pub and a restaurant through COVID and, it, and I'm back on the other side stronger than I was going in. I can do this. Nice. And that was yeah. the liberating moment. Once I figured that out, I was like, OK, let's take on let's Let's go after yeah. the music business and let's do this thing that I've done. <laughs> that I kind of know what to do. And as long, once I kind of turned my perspective and I saw it that way, I was like, I can do this. And then, right. then, then you just jump in fortune favors, the brave man, jump in and go and see what happens. Yeah. And that's what's happening. And that's exactly what's happening. And, and momentum is everything. And now listen, I'll not lie to you. Things are different for me than that last. I mean, social media is, it was, wasn't even, I mean, the first iPhone came out when my, when I was working at a publishing company the last time, you know, and so now it's learning and understanding the language of social media and communication and all the things that go with it. And I'm a quick study, but at the same time, I feel like the guy in the 1980s with the remote control trying to figure out how to turn on the TV sometimes. And so that's the, 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 the job for me is to take what I've learned as the musician and the, and the, the businessman, which is an empower me to go after my songs and putting them out there, but also, still be the student of what the game is today and apply all the new lessons that I'm trying to learn to the old lessons that I live by. And hopefully we find something in the middle and I find success along the way. Right. Okay. Right. Well, we're going to, we're going to throw to our sponsors and we're going to come back and rapid fire. we'll, we're going to do a little rapid fire questions that right. uh, we'll, one. we'll, we'll see, we'll see how rapid uh, <laughs> Turk McNamara can actually execute this. I will how give you, I will give you this one question that's going to come because you kind of blew through this earlier. All right. Um, I want you to tell us about the bench in Turk's Lounge. Okay, deal. All you right. You need now or, or when we come back? No, no, no. When we come back. Deal. That'll, right. that's, that's, be ready for that. Right after right. this. Yep. The bang tail pour is comprised of a sweet corn mash base. The front has a subtle sweetness and not too sharp. It has notes of a medium char or white oak for a smoky flavor in the middle. And the tail has a super smooth and warm finish.
Go behind the scenes with some of the biggest artists in music today with the Backstage Pass, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. Join Brandon Morrill and his co-host Kirsty Krause, Jeff McMahon, and Karen Lee Batten as they talk to rising stars and legends about their music careers. Listen to their latest tracks and learn fun facts about the men and women behind the music you love. And be sure to tune in to the Backstage Pass Monday through Friday from 3.30 to 6.30, powered by the SportsGuysPodcast.com. And welcome in to the Backstage Pass. Jeff McMahon back on the Backstage Pass with Kirsty Krause and our guest, Turk McNamara. Um, Turk, I, I had asked you, you know, you talk about soul being such a big part of your music, but um, I, I think it's a part of how you run the restaurant. It's a part of cooking when people do that and, mm -hmm. and eating, family, all of that. Do what? Leading. Too. Leading, like being, yeah, absolutely, and and one of the things that I know that has a soulful connection for you is the bench that you talked about having up in Turks Lounge. So so what? talk about that bench for a minute. Oh, the bench, okay, yeah, it, bench. yeah. <laughs> bench, bench, well, bench, bench, bench. <laughs> There were there were three major venues that were really important to me growing up. When I growing up, when I mean by moving here, I mentioned the two. I mentioned Douglas Corn. I mentioned Windows on the Cumberland, and then the other one was Mulligans. And Mulligans, when I first played, was a cabaret style pub. It sat maybe sixty people in down a shotgun old building, one seventeen Second Avenue North. It's one of the oldest buildings on on Second Avenue. And they had a church pew or like a bench with like captain's chairs or captain's tables set up. And it was really unique to Mulligan's. It was the only place I'd ever seen that had it. And so when I built Turk's Lounge as an homage to Mulligan's and all those years that I spent down there, I, I found a 13 foot long church pew that we put up in there. And we've got the captain's tables and it. it it allows people to kind of sit and watch the show in a, in a way that I would have sat and watched some of the acts that came in through Mulligan's. But it, it, it's it allowed, I don't know, it's just, it, it's my, it's my throw and tip of my hat to a place that. that was really, really important to me playing back in the day. It's cool that you can incorporate that. Oh, all something. of it. You got it. You got it. Everything that makes it, I mean, I can't really explain it other than the fact that Kirsty, we just care. I care so much about this thing. I care about the restaurant. I care about the employees. I care about my family. I care about the music. I care about the venue. I care about the opportunity. You know, and, and so if we can put everything we can into it and, and hopefully something gets out of it, then that's all it's for anyway, you know? Yeah. So, so all right, rapid fire. Come my on. rapid fire. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm changing it on the fly. I do have, a, I have another one that I'll ask in a second. So at uh, McInerney's Irish Pub and Restaurant, what is your favorite thing on the menu? That's going to be my rapid fire. Salmon. My favorite Salmon. thing on the, yeah, absolutely. Salmon with broccoli and mashed potatoes and, green, and gravy. It's unbelievable. Knock yourself okay. off. Yep. Cool. Get the salmon. I highly recommend it. Fish and chips won't go wrong either. I promise. I'm I'm going to have to cast my vote for the Irish stew. It's pretty good. Yeah, there's a secret um, ingredient into it. I can't tell you though. <laughs> uh, well, I I have not ventured past the Irish stew You're yet. Still on it. You just I've, go I've, that. I've, <laughs> I've I've it's it's a go-to, and it's I haven't I've not been disappointed, but I also haven't tried anything else yet either. <laughs> So. Well, hopefully you'll not be disappointed with anything else either. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, You're gonna enjoy it. Um, I don't know that this. I don't know that this is really a rapid fire question, but I don't. I don't think. I don't think with Turk McNamara there is a rapid fire question. But um, is there something, Turk, that you take lightly? I mean, you were just talking about caring so much, and I know that in the restaurant, everything is very intentional musically everything is very intentional are there can you think of something that you um that you kind of leave to the wind and see how it goes or do you really try to grab a hold of everything with the same level of intention i give okay so it's kind of a double there's two answers to your question one is I absolutely do my best to have my hand on everything that I'm involved with as much as possible. And at the same time, every time I go to bed at night, I go, God, it's all yours. And so, oh. I mean, it, it kind of, it, I do 
and I don't. Do you know what I mean? I, it's been mm -hmm. a big a big step for me was learning that sometimes you just got to let it go. Do you know what I mean? And trust that you're going to get to where you want to be. And and I've 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 kind of lived by that. But that doesn't mean you rest, and it doesn't mean you sit back. It just means that if it sometimes the journey takes you in a path you didn't think it was going to go as long as you get there. You know. Right. Well, well said. Right. Yes. I've Did got a couple ever... more. Go, Come Kirsty. On. Okay. Well, now I have another one. The cat follow. Um, what's the last like spontaneous thing you did? Like trip, anything? Last spontaneous trip that I did. Spont or just something spontaneous. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, I'm trying to stump. Yeah, normally yeah. our questions are not hard in rapid fire, but. I'm yeah, you know, I, I, I have four children and I have a restaurant and I'm trying to pursue the music so spontaneity is not as opportunistic in my life as possible um i you know i tell you sometimes just sitting down and, and hanging out and watching tv with the kids or something like that no cool. I, I, do, I don't do an awful lot of spontaneity right. yeah so one of the questions that um brandon our our other host uh likes to ask is um about what series may have been binge watch on netflix now i don't think that's a good question so i would ask you name one movie that you've watched all the way through oh my goodness plenty come on favorite okay movie well then give us then give us one well because you're so busy and i know I you work what, so can, hard at the even, restaurant i can even answer the first one because that's okay the, the way that paul give and us. i got it Ted Lasso on on Apple Plus TV. Ted Lasso. Oh, no kidding! Oh, oh my God, I love it. It's like hands down become one of my all time favorite shows. I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm, I can't wait for season three. Every time I watch it, I laugh out loud and I come out looking at the world. Hopefully, with eyes like him, and I go, "Let's do it and see what happens." It's great. Oh, love that. Making it through an entire series, even with the restaurant and four kids rolling. Well, they're easy, man. They're thirty five minutes in and out. You know, yeah. they're not that long. <laughs> okay, so gonna, for my rapid fire question, I was going to ask you how many guitars do you have oh uh, well i have multiple instruments because playing the irish music i play bazooki right. as well as tenor banjo and some others so i have let me see one two bazooki. three yeah it's an irish well it's a greek instrument that the irish got in the 1960s and they tune it like a fiddle just an octave lower mm -hmm. really important in irish music i play a ton of that so okay. oh let me see how many guitars do i have one two three four five six Mm. more than it. 10 how about that okay, we'll put it more that than 10. Gotcha. fair enough <laughs> when you That's have so, so many no yeah. <laughs> yeah when you have so many that you aren't sure well i have my i have my work guitars i mean i have my tools the ones that i play every gig and i mean i've got the 12 string the classical the bazooki and the tenor banjo so there's four right there and then I've got backups to a two of those in case anything okay, goes wrong yeah. to those. So there you go. I don't know. And then you had some ones that we have laying around the house for the kids. And yeah, you get to 10 quick. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. yep. Love it. <laughs> and you've also a uh, friend of the show, Troy Castellano. You've also got a few guitars right. up in the front of the restaurant because you're working with him on instruments for education, right? Oh my gosh, absolutely. This is a cool, wonderful, wonderful charity that Troy has started, Instruments for Education. We're a collection point for it. If you have a line, an instrument laying around, you want to donate it to this cause. What happens is if the instruments, they either go directly into the hands of the children and, and they get the opportunity to learn music where they wouldn't have in the past, or if it's a really nice guitar, sometimes they set it up for auction and then they have the opportunity to take the proceeds from that and buy multiple instruments. But the truth is, it goes back to the same conversation we had. Troy cares, like, a lot. It's so much so that when I met him for the first time, I mean, you can't help but be empowered by the passion he has for this thing and the opportunity yeah. to, pr pr to put music forward, once again, paying it forward, literally to kids. I mean, I, I try to push my children, not push them, but I want them to be musical. Music's important. But Troy Castellano is... Yeah, Instruments for Education is a great opportunity for us. I'm really delighted to be a part of it. Anything I can do to help with it, I'll always help Troy with that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yep. Well, we love that uh, you were able to carve some time out with us today. Make sure and let everybody know how to find you. Everything's at TurkMcNamara.com. Yeah, TurkMcNamara.com. Yep. You can find everything there. I'm also on Spotify, and I'm also on iTunes, obviously. And uh, What Happens in Between and Cold Liver Marine are the two so, uh, singles that are out right now. We've got a, a, the the video that you just saw is about ready to come out. And and we've got some more things coming. We're going to start doing some live streams from Turk's Lounge as time moves on, and, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to spread the word for that. But TurkMcNamara.com would be the place to start if you get a chance. I would be very grateful. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Any last thoughts, Kirsty? 
Uh, this has been our pleasure. So nice to hear you live today as well and get to hear a video on top of it. So make your way over to Mackinac's Irish Pub. I'm sorry, McNamara's Irish Pub and um, Restaurant and then also Turk's Lounge. There's a lot to check out there. It sounds like there's a lot on the menu music-wise and just overall culture of good people. So make sure you make your way there and check out the songs, like he said, on Spotify and all the streaming platforms. Excellent. Thanks for tuning in, guys. More coming this week with the Backstage Pass on behalf of Kirsty Krause and Turk McNamara. This is Jeff McMahon, and we will catch you later this week. Thank you again, Turk. Thank you so much, and Jeff. We'll Thanks, be Kirsty. I appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Yes, thank you.